Um, so, uh, so my name is Brenton Crawford. I'm from a um, data science consultancy uh, called Solve Geo Solutions, based in Melbourne, and uh, we specialise in the application of machine learning and other statistical methods to um, geoscience data, essentially. Um, to, in this talk, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, some of the things that we've run into during our time consulting in industry over the last few years. So. Um, I think sometimes we're sort of sold on machine learning as being this magical black box that can solve all our problems. We just have to shove data in one end and get information out the other end. So there's a lot of caveats to, to, to the way it needs to be used correctly. Um, and also, what, what are the major hurdles that we've encountered in actually successfully implementing machine learning inside companies, whether it be for exploration or, um, or in the near mine environment? Then I'm just, we're basically just gonna talk about a few of examples of those types of uh, workflows. And um, please stop me uh, in, in the middle if you want to ask a question. Happy to, um, to, to explain these things. Um, and I also just need to say thank you to Aurora Minerals Group, Newcrest and Core Scan for allowing um, this material to be, to be presented. Um, actually, I'll just, and just on the examples, we're going to just show an example of a superplus classification. We're going to look at clustering and regression um, and time pending, one other thing. So just to go back over a few um, of these words you've probably been hearing today, some, maybe some of you for the first time. Um, under the banner of machine learning, or first of all, what we're talking about when we talk about machine learning is what, what we're really referring to are systems that can learn from data without being, being explicitly programmed how and where to look. So um, that can be something very, very simple um, in the sense that uh, if you look at k-means clustering, for instance, um, that, that data is learning about the density distribution of your data. It's a really, really simple. Technically, it's learning from the data. It's machine learning. It's kind of not really machine. It falls under machine learning, but it sort of is. Um, something very, very complicated would be a deep neural network it's looking for some complicated object in an image. You know, that's obviously a lot more complicated. But they, they all fall under that same banner. They're just trying to understand something about your data without you having to tell them how to do it. Saying them like it's a person. The it should say it. Um, so we've got unsupervised learning, so Stephen was talking about SOM, SOM is a, a form of unsupervised learning, and unsupervised learning generally is, is exploratory data analysis, what we're doing when we're trying to understand our data. So we only have the data to tell us about the data, and this is very important, um, a very important step. Under unsupervised learning we've got something called clustering, and our basic clustering is just shoving together the data points that share property, some sort of property that you, you have assigned. Um, uh, We'll show an example of that as well. Under supervised learning, we've got classification and regression. So these are these are types of machine learning where we are training our model with our we're training an instant machine learning model with our model of how things work. And a model would come in the form of labels. So geological map would be a model that we would um, we could train our um, machine learning model to to learn from. And I'm going to show an example of that in a moment. Um, uh, so. And regression essentially is, is, is still learning from us, but we're trying to predict the value, not trying to predict a category or a class. So, so that's kind of the hierarchy of, of how these sort of words fit together. Um, uh, and they're all, you tend to do, often do all of these things in one project, or if there's a much more defined question, you may just pop in and do just a regression for someone or a classification. Um, that's all so before we get into the, the examples, the key thing I think that is really important to talk about is when shouldn't we use machine learning? You know, there's this hype around this word at the moment, um, and uh, sometimes there's a bit of a disconnect between the reality of what you could do with machine learning and what you can actually what you what you want to do, um, and also there could be much simpler methods that are much more easily communicable. Um, that would give you just a good, as good a solution that's not machine learning. So machine learning is not a solution for every problem, it's a solution for a very specific set of problems. Some of the key general things that you really would want to see when you would want to use a machine learning method would be you've got a large number of variables. If I've got uh, you know, a two, two elements to geochemistry data set, I can probably use a bivariate plot to see what's going on in that data set. But if I have a four acid digest, 46 elements, uh, data set, then all of a sudden I've got quite a lot of variables and it might be difficult for me to see what's happening across all those variables at the same time. If we've got a problem um, where we need to build rules across lots of variables that are not easy to define. So if I have a, a metallurgical model where iron greater than 2 <coughs> equals class A and that works beautifully, 
then I don't need machine learning for that problem. I can have explicitly programmed rules that will give me the solution I need, and everyone can understand I am greater than two equals this. Very, very simple to communicate. Um, so, so if we've got this, this small amount of data, not many variables, and we've got simple rules that can do the job, then we don't need machine learning, even though it might be nifty to use it. Maybe it improves accuracy by a, a fraction of a percent. Um, we probably don't need it. So, we've got lots of data. We don't know the rules that we need. This is where machine learning is going to really, really uh, help us out. Some of the things that, that come up in the way of us trying to implement these types of workflows consistently are data quality, consistency, and size. So, especially in expiration, as uh, some of the previous speakers were talking about, we don't have big data in expiration. We occasionally sort of start to stumble towards it, but most of the time we don't. We have historical data with temporal issues, so we've got 11 different geochemical chemical, chemical methods. Um, we've got you know, patchworks of different data sets that have been collected for different, different uh, siloed reasons. Um, the consistency of, of exploration data in particular is, is really terrible, generally, just to go and put you all in a pigeonhole. Um, and chemistry is the main, the main offender for that. It's a really powerful data set, but every time a um, a lab offers someone three dollars off a sample. They go and switch labs, and all of a sudden you have a different method. You have no consistency, and we can't do anything with those two data sets. So it's really annoying. Um, the uh, and, and data quality is another thing. We have large companies have you know mines that get acquired and reacquired over their lives. We have different regimes running the mine, different models existing through the mine, different things that are important at various times. So we have often have very messy databases as well. So clients often say, oh, the data's clean, the data isn't clean enough for, for what we need. So a lot of work goes into <coughs> to try and do that. So I think someone mentioned before, you know, will this ask the, ask the question for us? And I think in maybe in some scenarios we have very data-rich environments and, and very complex systems and potentially in the future it may be able to. In exploration right at the moment, if you don't have a good question, then <coughs> you're not doing science. So you need to ask a good question to start off with. You have to find the appropriate data that's going to answer you that question. And you need to pre-process that data potentially to actually make sure it's relevant to your, to your um, workflow. And that is most of the work in any job. Uh, so if you can achieve all three of those things, um, the, the actual machine learning part is only a little, little bit on the end there. So, um, so yeah. The, you still have to do science the way you've always done science, but now you have a little tool at the end that can do some really smart things with classification potentially, or regression or whatever you're doing. So, and the algorithm you choose is potentially not that consequential either. Um, you know, you may get a few degree, few percent difference in your um, accuracy, but but if you don't get these top three things right, you're on a hiding to nothing. You 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 really um, you're going to get a, a poor result potentially. The other thing I think someone else brought up before was, you know, the black box of, of machine learning. So, so is it a black box? So I guess it depends on who you ask. But for instance, if someone, if one of our clients comes up and says, "You build us a random forest classification model. Tell me exactly how it's working inside," we can't do that. It's just not possible. We can give you second-order indications about what's important in the model and other parameters that describe what's happening inside the box, but we can't go and show you 10,000 decision trees. Um, well, we could, but you'd probably be really bored and not be able to do with that information. So, so there is a level of opacity to, to a lot of these algorithms. Um, and especially if you're not a domain expert, they, they do seem like they're just a, you know, shove data one in and get magic at the other. Um, but I guess the key point we're trying to make here is that if you can do this with a linear regression or a sim single decision tree or something very simple, do that if it works almost as well. If you need that one extra percent of, of accuracy, then fine, we can throw a bunch of neural networks and you know, ensemble met learners at it, and maybe we get that accuracy down, but you, we're not going to be able to explain to you exactly how it's working inside, uh, or, or I don't know how to do that. <laughs> maybe someone can. Okay, cool, so that's the sort of the um, preachy part over. Um, now we're just going to look at some examples of how we're using this. So the first one is a supervised learning uh, example. So we're, we're trying to predict a class. Um, and essentially what we're trying to do here is we're searching for particular surface signatures in the Pilbara. And those surface signatures are going to come across a bunch of, of, of uh, remote sensing and geophysical type data sets. So here's the, the study area. This is the entire Pilbara Kraton. 
And you can see that we've got a, a, a very large area that we're, we're modeling here. Uh, I think it's five, five, 600 kilometers wide and 300 kilometers high. Um, and what the, the client really wanted to do here was, was a few things. Um, there's some additional prospectivity on that I can't show you, but, but, but what they really wanted to do as the first step was, is the mapping right? You know, we've got these 250k map sheets for the Pilbara um, that people, people have been using for a long time to make decisions on. Is it very good? I don't, if it isn't very good, where is it not very good? Um, if I was going to go do some additional mapping, where might I go to do that mapping? Um, can we find some areas in the map that are misclassified? So we're going to find more of a iron bearing lithology potentially that, that no one's got a tenant on? Probably, definitely not. Um, but uh, maybe there's some disagreement that we can leverage to help our exploration program. So what we're doing here essentially is we're training a machine learning classifier to recognise the signature of every different lithology in the Hammersley group and then a bunch of other groups that um, they're outside of that group as well, some more non-traditional targets. And we're saying, go through all 300 million pixels of my model and tell me how close I am to any of those particular lithologies. And I'll show you that in practice in a moment. So, um, so that, well, sorry, I should have skipped ahead. So what we've got the model is 262,000 square kilometres, 300 million data points. We've got 10, 15 hours of data depending on how we pre-process. That comes to 10 Landsat 8 scenes, uh, SRTM is about a bazillion SRTM tiles, um, regional radiometrics and regional aeromatic data. The nice thing about this workflow is it doesn't cost any money in terms of the data. They're all free data sets you can get um, from anywhere. So, um, so we've got our, our 10 to 15 layers of data. We've got it sampled onto a regular um, grid of, I think we did 30 or 40 or 50 meters, can't remember the resolution. And what we're going to do is we're going to teach our machine learning method to understand what the purple unit looks like, what the green unit looks like, what the red unit looks like, and there's about 35 other units that are in that, in that um, model. And then we're going to randomly, so we're going to do that by randomly sampling out of that lithology. And then we're going to randomly sample out of the everywhere else, the background as well. So essentially what we've got is a two-class part, two class classification, which is are you the lithology or are you not the lithology? So it's, a, it's just a binary question. And we're going to build you know, 35 odd different models that are all looking for the lithology you care about or is it not the lithology you care about. Okay. Here's all the data inputs. And so you can see there's four key sort of areas of data are coming from, but we can actually generate some derivative products from those images to um, potentially extract a bit more information. So from the mag, um, <coughs> we obviously need to reduce the poll, so we, we have our sources under our anomalies. Because um, we're looking at surface data, we want to try and enhance our geophysics, so we're looking at very near surface information. So we've got high pass, vertical derivative, um, we can use AGC, but um, carefully. And the idea is we want to enhance the mag, we don't want to destroy amplitude information, but we want to make sure we're looking at the nearest the surface as possible. With the RAD, we've just got you know, the various uranium, thorium, um, potassium, making sure they're not too noisy and they're in pretty good shape and you don't have any bad survey stitching issues. The Landsat is a real, really tricky data set to use. You have to try and merge scenes together, and that is a huge amount of work in itself, getting leveled, leveled remote sensing because they're collected on different days of the year and different, lim uh, different illumination, the suns and clouds are different on the days they were collected. So you know, when I was talking about that 80% is just getting the data in the right form, Probably 80% of that was just the land, dealing with the Landsat. So, um, and once you've got the Landsat, then you've got you know, uh, six bands that are all really highly correlated. So maybe we can do some principal components to give, so give ourselves some less correlated um, bands of that data. Um, we can do some decorrelation or just throw all the bands in. Um, tend to, tend to uh, try and throw a lot of variables in and let the algorithm sort out what it thinks is important. Um, then we've got the SRTM, the, the uh, digital elevation model, and then we want to look at the elevation, how curved the slope is, is it, is it rough, is it sloping, those types of parameters. And we feed in all those layers of data and we sample that to a regular grid, and then that becomes our, our base data set that we're going to do our um, build our classification model on. So, just to um, diverge for one second, with, um, so essentially, here we had a 300 million point model and we had to make hundreds and hundreds of these models with slight variations to, to try and stress test it. Um, it's not possible to do on a local machine you just, unless you had a really, really good desktop computer. So um, we use Amazon Web Services and Amazon is really, really great. They're offering a lot of free stuff to people who would want to try out Amazon. So they wooed us with free stuff. Um, and essentially for this particular project, 
we spun up four, four computers that are on the, in, in their cloud. Um, those computers were not particularly amazing computers, 16 CPU, 64 gig of RAM. Spun up four of those, and those four computers were all working on various parts of the workflow at the same time. So we didn't have to, if we were trying to run this on our local the sort of desktop, it would have taken like three or four weeks probably. So, um, and we needed to do work in that time. I can just sit there and wait for my computer to finish um, churning. So it took 52 hours to run all the models. Um, cost a dollar sixty-five per hour for all four of those computers. Three hundred and fifty bucks US for all that. It's not. It's a, it's a pittance, really. Um, so um, we had one one instance doing all the pre-processing, stitching the landsat, sampling uh, sampling the rasters onto data points, and we had three other ones running the machine learning models, recombining data, doing variable importance type analysis. And so it's only you know you get everything set up and go. It all runs in just a couple of days, and it's it's all very quick. Cool, so here's an example output. So basically the way this output looks is, it's a heat map. Um, so all of our 300 million pixels have a value, and that value is the probability of that pixel being a particular class, which is one of our maps. So it's a class A, B, C, D of lithology. Um, and you can see this is, I think, the Hammersley group here. Um, not surprisingly, that there wasn't really much interesting stuff outside of where it was mapped. If there was a new mapped Hammersley group found out of this process, I would have been very, very surprised. The, it's the money maker. Um, but you can see that there are some pixels outside of the map there, so the black lines are where it's very thin mapped. Um, and those are other iron bearing units that just happen to look really, really similar. So there's, I think one was Maramumba and a few other ones that just basically, they're, lithologically, they're, they're the same. Um, what we're doing here is we're only looking at pixels above 95%. About 95 percent probable. So we want, we, we, we've got actually values between zero and one, but what we want to do is say, I only want to look at the most sure you are of a certain lithology existing. And, um, and that's a good way of filtering out sort of lower order uh, things that maybe are similar in a way, but not as similar as we'd like. And the way we generate these probabilities, or maybe, maybe um, uh, some of the codes guys will might talk about that later, but Essentially, it's simple in the sense that if you make hundreds and hundreds of models, the proportion of the time that that pixel fell into one class or the other becomes a simple ratio that you can make into a, just a percentage. Um, the other thing I'd like to just step back and mention as well is that, um, that um, Matt, who's talking soon, and, um, and Steve, who gives some talks this afternoon, does some really great work on how to use machine learning in these big remote uh, regional data sets. I'd really recommend to, to look up their work um, as, a, as a grounding. Um, we certainly do, so I thought I'd mention them, those guys. So, um, yeah, so in terms of the algorithms we're using, it's not super duper important, but I think this particular one was um, around Random Forest and XGBoost, Boost, which are both types of decision tree based um, uh, algorithms. Um, but if you did it with a neural net or something else, you'd probably get quite similar results, I hope. Yes? Was that change between east and west uh, different scenes? Uh, which change? The confidence tends to change. Yeah, yeah. So this, this, is, this, is, this example is basically, so we did two versions of this model. One where each strip where you don't have to merge Landsat was its own model. And then we did one where we st stitched it all together and we basically did a bunch of averaging between them to, to make sure that we that there was no seam error. Um, and this is one of the ones where actually these are four separate models just stitched together. Mm. But you can see actually, luckily, Landsat <coughs> has a seven day revisit time. Um, and so you can get four swaths in a pretty short period of time, and they actually look pretty similar. They're just not, you know, very, very, very close together. So um, the trouble is, like, if you want to do this with Aster, then it's very difficult to find that much Aster. That's all, you know, you can see the merge of Australia looks a bit, bit patchworky because it's really hard to find things that are very similar. Excuse me. I'm, 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 I might have missed it, but sure. did you use any, any sort of training, training points to train that on? Yeah, so the geological map was the training. For this. So you just took that as gospel at the start? Yeah, so basically what we did was we took a random sample of, of, of points that fell within oh, each lithology yeah, okay. and we did that a lot of different times. Um, so we didn't just make one model, we made hundreds of models. Yeah. And so the idea is that you're going to sample the diversity in that, in that polygon because you've taken different, different random samples each time. Um, but yes, the map is, is, is it's not gospel, but the idea would be that if the map's really wrong, we'll see it in the result here. We're going to have multiple signatures that are being mapped, called the same name, but don't have the same signature. And the, and the model's probably going to complain about that, and we're going to be able to see something about that. So, yes, we are using but that model. I mean, that map is very good. It's been developed over a very long period of time, and 
um, it's got a lot of value. This is a way to sort of add to the value of the mat and, and really rigorously test it, which is difficult to do with, with things made by people walking along the ground and, and making observations. Can you easily get from that information which the weighting of the different um, data sets you used, like yes. what's the weighting of the magnetics compared to yep. gravity compared to... You just preempted my next slide. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's determining what variables are important. So let's, for instance, say that we have, we're trying to predict Hamersley Group versus the rest of the world. We have a two-class model. What variables do I need, what variables are important in defining the Hamersley Group from all the other variables? And what we actually did with this one here was what, was what were the important variables from defining the Hamersley Group from all the other iron-bearing units that actually look really, really similar? So if we're going to try and split them apart based on some very small difference, what are the variables that we want to, um, to use to split them up? So, this particular method is called recursive, recursive feature elimination. It's a type of variable importance, I guess you would call it. It's basically, it, there's millions of, not millions, there's lots of methods to work out what variables are important in a, in a model. Um, but this one we like because it, it takes into account that if you have two variables that both have the same information in them, you know, for instance, Landsat bands three and four, they're highly correlated, I, they're not both important. I only need one of them. And, I, and one of them will be better than the other. So this, this tells you what the order of variables I would use to make the most optimal model. So you can see here this line here essentially is showing us um, obviously got variables, the number of variables along the, the x-axis and on the y-axis we've got the accuracy of the model. Okay, so what we can see is if, if I adjust, these are just two different versions, two different, um, two different model runs. So if we look down the bottom here we've got, um, what have we got up here? 65%. Oops, I can't use the laser point. So, Oops. Can you so use, down, use so the chicken if you want. Actually, I think I would like the hands-on. So. so down here we can see that if we were to use one variable to pick the rock for everything else, it would be potassium. In both versions of this model, we get a model that works about 65% accuracy if we just use potassium. So potassium is clearly the most important variable to pull them apart. If I want to take the model to 78% accuracy, I need to add something from the DEM. And that, in two different models, it was two different things. One of them was just the raw DEM elevation values. Strangely, the Hammersley has a really, really discrete height it exists at, which is kind of cool. Um, but the other one is called TRI, which is the Terrain Roughness Index, basically how bumpy is the ground. So the bumpiness of the ground and the elevation are the second most important variables. But if we want to take that model up to sort of, you know, high 70s, uh, we want to use principal component 2 of the Landsat 8. And if we keep going and going and going, eventually we stop getting a return for our adding of variables. We get this flat line which says, keep adding as many variables as you want, the model's not getting any better. So, that's, that's generally um, not a good idea to keep adding variables if they're not helping because that will help, that will cause overfitting in your model. So what you want to do is probably prune your variables back to the point where they just stop helping you improve accuracy. That's kind of the rule of thumb I guess you would describe. So you can see up here that you know things like the AGC of the mag, um, uh, I'm not sure what 11 and 12 there, um, total count of the radiometrics, component 3 of the thing, they're not giving you anything that's not already got from other variables. <coughs> so you don't really probably need to include them. So when you have cover though, and some of those uh, input data sets are rendered ineffective, as you handle. Yeah, this is this is a, this is for outcropping geology. Yeah. Yeah. So all those data sets are looking at outcrop, uh, or if you've got non-transported regolith, potentially you can it will be able to deal with that. We have used this effectively in in place where you've got residual soils and things like that. But obviously, if you don't put data sets in that can't see underground, then you can't see underground. So that's kind of the, so the idea with this would be that. This could be a layer of a prospectivity model that looks at surface data. You need to add some other layers in if you want to start taking in the subsurface. You want to map things on the cut, you'd have to have a separate model. That's just yeah, and maybe they can talk to each other at a later date in some sort of you know, waste evidence model or something like that. Or, um, but, but yeah, the key, we're, we're looking at surface data here just because the data's easier to find. That's kind of the reason. But if you have a lot of several layers of data underground, then this method's not really any different. So. Are, they, are they sort of consecutive iterations or are they quite far apart? Uh, I don't really remember. They might even be different algorithms as well, because we ran the ran, ran forest, which is a bag tree versus a boosted tree, so they will do quite different things. Um, so, uh, yeah, I can't really remember exactly, but yeah, they, they potentially could be a long way apart. Um, but they're pretty... The thing you'll notice about, you take different random subsets of data and calculate a model, you can get quite big differences, that, and they perform similarly well, It's kind of, which is kind of interesting. Um, so there's lots of other ways to, um, to work out which variable is important. Some of them um, actually, um, some of the other ones are like Gini index is a, is a really common one, which basically just says, I don't care if the variables are correlated, but 
um, there's a coefficient that says how well I'm going to split these two classes up. And the value of that is basically going to, you know, I might have three or four variables that have the same information. They'll all rank highly in that. The nice thing about this is it doesn't do that. It says I, I just need the best one of those, and then the other ones are not really that helpful. All right, cool. So here's a, I guess, more of an interesting example. So this is, I can't remember the name of the unit, but it's one of the more non-traditional iron targets. And what you can see here is we've got the probability values from the model. This is the average probability over, you know, hundreds of models between zero and one. So one being every single one of those models, this thing was returned as the class we care about, which is so this morphology. And, and zero means that in all the models we ran, it never came back as being called that class. Um, in the black lines, you can see that's where the map has that unit existing. And you can see that um, it's kind of nice in the sense that you can see that there are high probability values that are approaching one, that are a long strike of mapped, um, like continuous coherent bodies, a long strike of what's been mapped. Um, and you can see lots of other areas that are very high probability that have not been called that. So if I was going to go mapping and I cared about that, that unit, I would go to the areas where I have high probabilities and I would ground truth them essentially, it's similar to what Stephen was saying before about, you know, oh sorry, um, James was saying about, you know, you, you cluster your SOM and then you have a class map, you don't know what the classes are, you <coughs> go check, check them out you know, visually on the ground. So this is essentially pointing us to areas where we are likely to have more of the thing we care about. So the nice thing about this is that, forget lithology for a moment, just pick anything on the ground you care about. It might be the footprint around a mine, or it might be a, just outcrop of any kind. The, the, what you search for is not really important. The workflow will work with whatever, whatever you decide to search for. You're just searching for a multivariate signature using a machine learning classification model, and, and it will apply to wherever you need it to apply. The, the nice thing about this compared to, you know, earlier versions of classification, I guess, you know, remote sensing would be a key one, is that if you're searching through your Landsat and you want to classify a particular type of response, uh, which they do routinely in remote sensing, they often use some sort of vector similarity type approach. It'll be like spectral angle mapping or something like that. And the critical part about that is, is that the thing you're looking for can only look one way. It's a single vector, multivariate vector, and you're matching everything to that one vector. It might be a USGS mineral library or it might be, you know, some type of land cover with these machine learning models is they, they understand that a, an object that you're searching for can look multiple different ways. It doesn't have to look one way, it can look a hundred different ways. It can be weathered, it can be non-weathered, it can, it, can, it can understand that complexity that, that you don't get from very simple classification you, models. Sorry, excuse me. If, you, if you're just like throwing a bunch of dips and maybe drill hole intersections that could predict uh, lithology on the cover? Um, it would, yeah, but it, would, it would really depend um, on on the type of all the like layers of data you've got. Um, it depends. The tricky part with, with drill hole data, you know, obviously this is nice and spatially, you know, it's a grid of data essentially. Um, under undercover you've got sporadic, you know, isolated measurements here and there, I guess. Um, I mean, if the variables you have in your model find the thing that like define the thing that you're searching for, then I think yes. But I would have to know about the, all the layers you've got. And the idea that you want to have lots of different layers of data have different kinds of information in them. If you just put structural dip in and azimuth, something like that, you'd probably just put the most stir in it and pick yeah. the ones with a certain orientation or something like that. So, so the, the key to this is integration of lots of different layers of different kinds of data. So if you had you know, the dip information, then you had gamma and you know, a magnum version or something else, and you add those things together and you need, and what you're looking for is kind of a complicated signature in that data, then, then yeah, that would be more appropriate, I think. Just, sorry, one other question. Sure. So these are stratigraphic units that you're picking. So maybe there are finer stratigraphic intervals between them. So did you do? Did you just pick the training data randomly, or did you do some sort of yeah? So strategy. Yeah. So the only strategy we had was that you weren't allowed to pick any pixels that were in a certain buffer zone of an edge. So if we have two polygons and we've got a 50 meter pixel that's over the top of the two of them, we don't want to sample that pixel as our training. Uh, so just in JS where we spent buffers around every single unit and said you have to grab all the layers that, um, are, that are grab real random sample from areas that aren't within 100 meters of the edge of the polygon basically. In terms of the random sample, we want to see everything that's inside. We want to see the diversity of what's inside here. Yeah. And so for instance what you see is that there's, there's some lower areas, lower probability areas, you know, sort of 70s, 50s, um, that are coming back about half the time in one unit and half the time in another. Those are potentially pixels of, you know, rocks that are kind of weathered like those rocks or something like that. You know, a second order similarity, it's not enough to call it 
you know, very similar. It's, it's, a, it's a less similar thing. There could be something to do with the geomorphology looking similar, or the, but it hasn't had all the ingredients right to, to be called that unit, if that makes sense. So you will see, you'll see that kind of information when you've got diversity that maybe the map's wrong as well, that you'll see that kind of inherency of the probabilities at the other end. So if you zoom out, and we also filter our probability, so we only look at things greater than 90%, we can see we get some nice elongate coherent bodies, which is kind of nice, because you know this unit is mapped in a form that looks like that. Um, interesting, we get some areas where we've got mapped, this mapped unit, but the model says that stuff looks nothing like the rest of this unit. And then we get some other areas, you know, that look kind of maybe you could argue that looks spatially similar, so coherently and, and sort of morphologically similar. Um, but it's not mapped as that, it's a long way away. So I don't know the answers, we don't know whether this is right or wrong, but we at least now have a plan to go and do some field work and, and check stuff out. So we zoom out again, so now we're looking at the whole field where you can see that it's hard to see from so far away, but you can see there's quite a lot of material that looks a lot like this particular unit. Um, and, you know, Lots of choices here, places to go. So, I would imagine this um, method will be picked up by the geological surveys to check their own maps. Go oh, yeah. and, um, Maybe they already have been doing it. Yeah, yeah, I think it's logical. Yeah. They do that. So the nice thing is, if the rocks are sticking out of the ground, then you know all the data you need is probably um, uh, available. But if it goes undercover, then all of a sudden we've got a paucity of data that we don't know how to, to come up to, to fix. Um, so yeah, so okay, so that's the uh, supervised classification. That's how we might apply that type of scenario to a um, to a big regional data set. If we wanted to zoom in on any of those regions and, and zoom in in terms of resolution, maybe we've got you know a <coughs> survey or a very detailed survey, then we do it again at a finer resolution as long as we've got the data to, to do that. Or something like this might just become one of the layers in a multi-layered prospectivity model that's got faults and other other um, types of information in it. So rather than sticking a geo map in as your prospectivity layer, you put in the probability of that geo layer being correct, according or talking to your data, I should say, not correct. All right. So the next thing I'll talk about is is a regression. So this is instead of trying to predict a class, at, you know, like where's the Hamilton group and where isn't it, we're talking about where um, how can we predict one variable from another variable. And in this case, what we're trying to do is predict a type of rock hardness parameter from coarse scale mineralogy. Um, just before I go to, into too much of this, so just to really quickly go through, what, most of you guys know what core scan is, they're doing a talk right next door, I think, right now. Mm -hmm. But it was basically a shipping container lab, you feed your drill core through, it images that core, and, and you can get essentially maps of mineralogy of particular sets of minerals from that data. And so this company had this, this, this rock hardness parameter, and, um, and they had core scan, but they had way more core scan than they had rock hardness parameters. They wanted to um, essentially see if they could extend that measurement out onto their, their whole ore body. And coarse scale mineralogy generally looks at soft minerals, lots of, lots of micas and chlorites and things like that. So we didn't think it was going to work because, you know, how can you predict how hard rock is when you don't have, you're not looking at any of the hard minerals, quartz and feldspars and things like that. Um, so we've only got things like sericites and epidotes and chlorites to look at. But so what you're looking at in the background is the rock hardness measurement in grey, and then the colourful lines are various regression models using the coarse scan. Um, and this particular measurement, you, could, you have to average it over, over given intervals to kind of, otherwise it was very noisy because it's a very small type of measurement. Um, and overall you can see that the model actually captures the major changes in, in, the, um, in, the, in the hardness of the rock quite well. Um, and we found that actually linear regression was good enough for this, which meant we got an equation at the end where we could say chlorite minus epidote plus 25 equals how hard the rock is. So you get a very simple answer at the end. Um, we got 6% better error if you go and use a random forest regression, which is completely uninterpretable, but it gets you a slightly better answer. So which one's better? I think the linear regression one is definitely better. People seem to believe you know, linear regressions because they've been around for a long time. So. Um, cool, so the nice thing is that you've collected this big core scan data set, which is you know, costs a fair bit. Um, and now you've been able to add a bunch of value to that data set by linking another data set quantitatively to it. The extra nice part was that, um, so here's another hole here, the blue is, the blue line is our predicted hardness, and the um, grey line is, sorry, the grey the gray line is, the, sorry, the actual hardness, and the blue line is our regression. You can see that it's matching pretty well, and 
Um, some holes they didn't have this measurement, but on other holes you were actually unable to take the measurement because the rock came out so broken they weren't not able to actually use the device to, to measure. So um, you can see that that's the power of it. You can you can extend measurements out potentially where you where you can find a good quantitative relationship, and and that's not always the case. You can't always find this kind of nice relationship. It's it's kind of cool when you do that. So next we're going to talk about data-driven domain. Um, so um, Stephen was also talking about this in terms of you know um, doing the SOM, doing some K-means classes at the end, and giving yourself some categories at the end that you can you can look at spatially. So um, and what we're using is using unsupervised learning. Different to Stephen, we're not putting this through a SOM. We're just taking the data and clustering it. We're not putting it through a, a, a SOM uh, sort of middle middle step. So Corskin has a couple of issues. It's great data set and it's so rich in data that they were finding a lot of their clients were kind of drowning in it. Um, so they collect a, a 512 channel spectra every 500 microns on a bit of drill core. So you get 100,000 of those measurements per metre. So you get millions and trillions and trillions of pixels by the time you do a whole deposit. Um, and some data sets I've seen up to 50 something, 50 plus minerals to find in that data. So um, when you give your, you know, I think uh, before they were talking about in Reflex, they have you know, the, the nice strip logs while the geo is logging. That's all well and good when you've got three things next to your drill core, but what if you've got 103 things? How do you get a geologist to look at those 103 columns and make a decision on whether that thing gets called class A, B, C or D? It's pretty hard for, the, for a person to do. So what, what, maybe we can upscale our data so we can, we can try and um, see the forest for the trees, see, see those big classes, and um, I know June Hills Wave or Transform does something like this as well. Um, how can we upscale the data, and also how can we get 52 or 105 variables down to 10 clusters, for instance? So that's kind of why we want to do this thing. So what's the process? So we take, how do we get from spectra up to, to big domains to that? How do, we, how do we get all the way from that tiny little spectra all the way up to big domain deposit scale boundaries? So for starters, then we, we first we take the image. So this is an example of a core scan mineral, mineral image. Um, what we do then is we can tr we can then pre-process that data in a bunch of different ways. One, we can just look at the proportions of the data, so how much of that image is made of chloride or sericite. We get a, we get a number for that. We get a proportion potentially. Um, then, or we can actually go through and calculate the association of minerals. How many times is mineral A touching mineral B? And what we end up with is basically an association matrix. Um, then we can calculate some second-order statistics from that matrix potentially and use those. Yeah, sure. And, we, and then we, what we want to do is we want to crush that data. And then we want to plot that data in reduced dimension space to actually check and make sure it makes sense. So um, SOM is one way you can potentially do that. SOM is a dimensionality reduction, uh, sorry, a dimensionality reduction technique where you can take lots of variables and display it on a 2D plane for you to analyze. We use a different method called TSM, <coughs> which is called T, T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, just for a super duper long name. But there's lots of different methods for dimensionality reduction. So then we're going to check our, um, our clusters and make sure they look, they make, look sensible. And then we can plot those clusters down hole. So what we can see is because core scan is still so high resolution, we end up with you know very noisy logs. You know, we could have we could extract core scan at one centimeter intervals. So if I cluster that data at one centimeter intervals, it's probably not going to be very usable for a geologist. So then what we can do is we can try and smooth out some of that um, some of that some of that uh, um, you know, let's call it noise, but just high resolution information we don't really require. Um, June Hill's uh, work with the wavelengths would be a great way to do that, but I haven't worked out a way to do it with cluster numbers yet. Um, but what we tend to do is just use a, a median filter that uses multiple passes and replaces everything with the most common, the most common variable around it. It's not, it's a bit ugly, but it tends to do, do pretty well. So what we end up with is we can make, you know, here's our 25 meter centimeter clustering, one meter clustering, four meter clustering. We can just keep smoothing until you get to um, the, the desired scale. So here is this, this particular data set. This is from a, a, a scan called Mangana. This is the one that had, I think, the most ever recorded minerals found in the Swear. It was like 57 or something like that. And I haven't been able to show all 57. I've just showed a few. But imagine having 57 columns of that kind of level of information and being told to domain that into alteration groups or geological groups or the combination of geology and alteration groups. It's pretty difficult. So the logging, this clustering isn't the log. It's just that some, another tool to help the geo make the log. So we don't, we're not trying to automate the logging, we're just trying to give them a summary of all that really complicated data that helps them make a good, a good choice. So this isn't, isn't about replacing, it's just about giving them additional tools. So this is a different deposit. This is um, 
uh, a deposit called Antiquary in South America. Um, and this is another scan. You can see that you put all the minerals in and you cluster it out. They got domains that were, by and large, very, very similar to their logged domains. But this is completely data driven. We've used no model in this, in this in the creation of these domains. So you can see it's a nice check on what you've, the way you think the world works by getting this very similar product with, it, with a completely data driven method. Okay. Am I nearly I'm basically done? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'll, just, I'll just stop there. I, I can talk a bit more stuff, but I'll stop. Uh, yeah. Do, do we have question, question time? Okay. Are we doing questions? Or should, or, sure, yeah. we have time for a couple of questions. Can you believe when you were combining the main set, did you actually leave it as radius or did you convert it back to something like, more like reflectance? Um, yeah, so no, we didn't convert to radiance. Um, a lot of those um, stitch, stitchings are better done without the sort of raw digital numbers, um, according to our, Mike Hussey, who is our, who is our kind of guru for helping us put these together. Um, and uh, yeah, so we did, the idea was that you have to have atmospheric corrected data, yes. but you don't want to go and be fiddling with the digital numbers too much. You don't want to do top's atmosphere correction or anything like that. So what you want to do is play. What we've found is that in all, in all data inputs, it's best to put into the most meaningful data set that you can. Sure. So if you, if you can go all the way to reflectance, do it. Yeah. Uh, radiance is better than just the normal you know, the normal DMs, I suppose. Yeah. But, but even if you've got DMs, you, you've still got atmospheric effects in there. Really. Yes. Yeah. So so the, the data using those DMs you're getting when you download the highest level correction is already atmospheric corrected. Those DMs aren't like the raw things in the cell. They have already been processed by by, and the particular method we use, which is called pseudo invariant features, specifically requested you don't change them from digital numbers. So you, you just rescale them from the root. So you don't don't convert to radiance and don't convert to top of atmosphere. Um, so yeah, we just followed. I'm not a remote sensing uh, guru. We just followed the uh, advice from Mike and a few others. So, but um, it's very difficult to get good good merge, especially when they're a long way like a long way apart in time and things like that. So we haven't really tried too much with Asta. We can generally get two scenes together, but when you try out another one, it starts to fall apart. So. Well, Andy Green next school, he specialised in actually normalising yeah. and stitching, uh, stitching together various scenes. Really yeah, so it's really very difficult. And maintaining the spectral integrity. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's really tough. <laughs> I, can, I, I feel for it. <laughs> um, earlier we were talking about, like, um, the sort of the sort of drills and, like, you know, continuous data bus. Is there a way to kind of you know build a model with the point data and then use the distance from those points as like a risk of I'm thinking in pole because that's where I'm from, but you know a risk of deviation from that point and then put those data sets into something like this. Right. So you've made a model that's got some spatially dis you know, discontinuous data, and then at the end you want to apply some uncertainty to that model based on how far you are from data or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think you can do something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Distance to data points is something that's probably pretty important to, to having a model that's especially if it's really, really discontinuous. So. One more. Yeah. Uh, with the build one, I thought it was great um, and really clear introduction too, um, but one thing that a lot of the, I'm not a geologist, but is the strap column. I'm just wondering how hard it would be to incorporate something that's not sort of gridded stuff. Would it pop it out? Would it be too hard to put in there? Um, I guess, I guess you are training it on the strap column because the map was built using the strap column. So I guess if, if you're training your model from the map and the map is in line with a, with a given stratigraphic column, then you are training the stratigraphic columns knowledge into your. It's already in there. It's already in there. Yeah, yeah. So the, um, you know, the the order in which units occur. I mean, if you want to get really complicated about, it, maybe you could say that, you know, this pixel can't be highly probable unless it's highly similar, but also in the right spot spatially compared to the things that should sit above and below or something like that. Maybe. But, yeah. But yeah. So the thing that we didn't use in any of this just to stipulate as well, there's no spatial information put into that model. So the fact that two pixels are highly um, similar next to each other. That's, we haven't put X, Y in, in that model. That's critical. Um, if sometimes if you want to force your model to look a bit more spatially coherent, you can put X and Y in. I don't know if Matt's got a thoughts on why, when it's good to put X, Y, and Z into models, but... Um, Not very often. Yeah, sometimes some people do, especially with downhole data, they put that thin often. Um, but sometimes it can do good things maybe and bad things other times. 
you, you can put spatial information in, mm -hmm. and, and it approaches a, a weights of evidence. Uh, Wolfie, what I call Wolfie. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but but that, that sort of approach is, I mean, you just got to be, you just got to be cognizant of what you're doing. Yeah, that's right. So yes. you don't over interpret. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I think. Okay. Um, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Just EJ had a question. No, but that's. Yeah. Sorry. One. I feel like we just stopped at a very interesting point. So we can talk about this later if you just want to talk but, about uh, it. <laughs> in your uh, notes, I see that your presentation <coughs> allows the example for the different texture classes uh, in your classification. Yeah. Uh, that is quite applicable for other work that you do down more. You have the mythologies that are mixture. Yes, so definitely. Yep. So, can you just comment a little bit about how you have to do that? Sure. So um, I guess a, a feature of almost all these machine learning models is you can have uh, variable belonging to various groups to different proportions. So that's kind of the main power. We're using that 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 um, that that uh, uh, sort of point in that entire Pilbara work that we're talking about. The fact that something can sort of belong to a, a class 52 percent of the time. You know, like it's, so that that geology is very transient. So lumping it into class A, all this is often not a very good thing to do. And our work with texture is showing that texture is like the most transient, difficult thing to, to um, capture because if you look at a rock with texture, it never has one texture in it. It's always got, you know, that one there. It's got some just something that looks like disseminated at one end. It's got something kind of looks like a vein. Maybe for some people we'll call it bleb. Geologist A would call it something different to geologist B. So um, we have to, we struck straight away, we have to use something that can have certain um, unit elements to belong in of each one. So the way this method was done was really painstakingly. I went through like a thousand images and said this is disseminated, this is vain, this is massive, whatever. Um, and then we imputed them to even make more of them, so we had to do some um, smote um, on them, uh, which is kind of inventing data, which is not necessarily a good thing to do all the time. Uh, and then we ran it on the other 100,000 images, and this was one of those images. So you can see that you know, it kind of looks like a vein, kind of looks a bit blebby. It's, you know, it's, the other thing about the uh, texture in an image is you only get an idea of the overall image texture. We haven't been able to go into the image now and say, that's the vein, there it is. Whoever figures that one out first is going to be um, very successful. So, it's, um, so yeah, but basically it's just a machine, just a, I think it's a random forest classification model, built on me looking through thousands of images, hundreds of images, and, um, and, and what I tried to do with those images was find, not end member categories, but find the really guts of a texture group, you know, the things that really obviously look like something. So when they start getting mixed up, we let the model figure that out because it'll fall into one class sometimes and another class other times. So that that that, that sort of you know fact looks a bit blurry and veiny. I didn't really show this thing blurry and veiny images. I showed it veiny images and blurry images, like the, the key, the critical kind of middle of the group images, I guess. And I sort of cheated in how to choose those images because I just did some unsupervised stuff and plotted them, you know, in, in lower dimensional space and went, that's probably a group, that's probably a group. And then I just went and grabbed 20 or 30 from each group and that was my training set. So. Um, but yeah, uh, but the nice thing is, as you get more and more data, all of a sudden the machine now knows what 10,000 veins look like or a million veins. Um, so the more, the more images you show it, the smarter it's going to get at knowing what a vein looks like or a disseminated or something like that. On that I note, shut up there, so. <laughs> when you drag it out to the hall, if you need some more, thank you, friends.